Good afternoon. My name is Matthew Diller, and I have the honor of being the dean here at the Benjamin N. Cardozo School of Law, and I'd like to welcome you this afternoon uh, to really an incredible program, I have to say. Um, uh, to Professor Tony Seabach and Miriam Gillis have put together a stellar um, who's who dream team uh, cast of uh, of people to comment on uh, on the 9/11 fund, and um, you know it's a great time to look back over uh, over what transpired 10 years ago and has affected us all in such many and deep ways. Uh, but one of the things that really unique things, or so we thought unique at the time, to come out of it was the creation of the Victims Compensation Fund, which. Um, <coughs> is an amazing, um, uh, I don't know, legal structure, I guess we shall call it. Uh, and you can think of it in many different ways, as I'm sure our, our uh, group here has and will. On the one hand, you can think of it cynically, or not so cynically, as a uh, device designed to keep our airlines in business and the planes uh, flying and to protect a series of potential tort defendants. Um, but on the other hand, you can also think of it in a much loftier sense as really an expression of our nation's compassion and uh, empathy for the victims of 9-11 uh, and really our public attempt to help them in every way that we can. And, um, and since it was a unique creation, it was all created out of whole cloth uh, in about two weeks after the uh, after September 11th, so it was put together with amazing speed, uh, and then implemented uh, with really uh, amazing speed by Ken Feinberg, who did a superb job um, dealing with the families and uh, the survivors of uh, of September 11th uh, with dignity and respect and understanding. Uh, both the um, the complexities of defining what is fair compensation in this uh, in this context, um, but also with dealing with the human dimensions of the uh, of the uh, crisis. I myself had the um, uh, I won't say honor, but I had the experience of uh, being at um, a couple of the hearings before the Victims Compensation Fund. Uh, and I was extremely impressed with the, uh, again, the, uh, the human side of it, the degree of dignity and respect which people were treated. Um, so thank you for joining us today, Ken, and uh, thank you um, for all of uh, the rest of you on our program. I'm just looking uh, at you, and I know that um, this is a great assemblage, appropriately taking stock of what was created 10 years ago which we thought was designed to really address a unique circumstance which would never again happen. Nothing like this would ever again happen. And then lo and behold, um, nothing like September 11th indeed has happened. However, um, mass disasters have proven to recur with some regularity uh, in our society. And, and uh, when we set up compensation funds and when we don't set up compensation funds, how they're run and how they're administered is indeed a critically important question going forward, um, in part because I can't assure you that we've seen our last mass disaster, unfortunately. Um, well, that's kind of a glum, glum way of, uh, of segueing. So um, let me introduce at this point um, really a uh, one of the stars on our faculty, a expert on tort law. Um, and one of the most uh, thoughtful academics that I know, uh, Professor Anthony Seabach, who has organized today's program. Uh, and so, Tony, at this point, I just wanted to say thank you on behalf of the school, and please, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean, and thank you for the support that you've provided uh, to allow the school and to allow Professor Gillis and I to explore uh, an issue that is tangential perhaps to the uh, emotionally charged topic of 
but which I think for a law school represents exactly the kind of problems that we should be thinking about, not just in the immediate aftermath of a disaster, but also um, uh, for all time to be helping to add to academic and practical knowledge in law and the support that was given to me to help put this together so quickly, I, I'm very grateful for. I'm also very grateful to uh, our uh, panelists um, who will be introduced by Professor Gillis, but I want to personally express my gratitude. I apologize for the tight squeeze. Um, there are a variety of reasons for that, um, but uh, mostly that we want to get you all to be looking at each other and talking because the goal of this afternoon is to have a robust, wide open, and, and free conversation. Now, uh, I'm just going to now briefly introduce uh, Ken Feinberg, who needs no introduction, on the way out today from the restaurant where we had met for lunch uh, as I was waiting to take care of uh, business. Uh, and Ken had gone on with Professor Gillis and others to come to the school. Just half an hour ago, a man came up to me and said, was that Ken Feinberg? Was that Ken Feinberg? <laughs> and he turned to his wife and says, this has made my week. <laughs> and uh, you know that kind of celebrity sighting maybe can only happen in New York City, I don't know. But uh, it made my day. Uh, Ken Feinberg is uh, one of America's leading attorneys specializing in uh, mediation and alternative dispute resolution. Uh, Ken Feinberg was appointed special master uh, of the September 11th Victims Compensation Fund and currently serves, uh, actually this biography is a little out of date, currently serves as the special master of the TARP Executive Compensation uh, Fund. I think that's probably no longer true, but additionally um, serves uh, is the administrator of the BP Deepwater Horizon Disaster Victim Compensation Fund. And in fact, maybe this is an interesting uh, observation. Maybe Linda will enjoy this. So I pulled this off of Wikipedia because I wanted to pull something fast, right? What does it really say? It says that Ken is the government appointed administrator of the BP Deepwater Horizon Disaster Victim Compensation Fund. I don't know if that's actually accurate, <laughs> but an interesting question, raising the question that I hope we will talk about, which is what is the relationship between the state, society, and private litigation in the face of mass disaster? Um, on a personal note, uh, Ken Feinberg is the epitome of the combination of academic achievement, acumen, and practical consequence. Uh, really, there can be no better, I think, career in law than to combine those two. I certainly wish I could do more as what he has done practically, and, and, and he has done it with no sacrifice at all in terms of depth and perception of how the law could be and should be from the scholarly perspective. There's a long list in his biography of schools which Ken has been a professor at. He's a visiting professor, he's an adjunct professor. I won't read them all because uh, it's too long, but Ken, thank you for coming to our school. I must say at the outset that um, this is a small crowd. I have never in the 10 years that I've been uh, associated with the 9-11 Victim Compensation Fund ever had a more stellar co-cast than the people at this table. I mean, everybody's going to get their money's worth in the next few minutes. Uh, this is a really extraordinary group that I'm part of here today. Now, I'm only going to take about 25 minutes, and I'm going to just make three points about the 9-11 Fund so that we set the stage for my listening to what uh, will come from this, uh, from this panel. One, the genesis of the 9-11 Fund. Where did it come from and why? Two, why was it successful? Why did it work? Why did 97% of all eligible families who lost a loved one on 9-11, World Trade Center, the airplanes, the Pentagon. Uh, why was it successful? What were the keys to success? And three, very important, a subject of great interest to Professor Rabin in particular, I think, uh, what, what, what does the future hold in terms of the 9-11 fund as some sort of precedent? What does it tell us about replication? Okay three points. First, the genesis of the fund. Well, uh, the dean, Tony, mentioned it very, very briefly. Eleven days after 9-11, Congress passed a law. It passed a law after one day of deliberation. The law was initially designed to help the airlines avoid bankruptcy, to discourage lawsuits, and to provide financial incentives and subsidization for the airline industry. But, at the 11th hour, Congress decided to add another section 
creating the September 11 Victim Compensation Fund. And the law simply said that anybody who lost a loved one on 9-11 or was physically injured as a result of the attacks could voluntarily choose to opt out of the tort system and voluntarily decide in their own particular case to take totally funded government taxpayer money in lieu of tort. You don't have to. If you want to sue, you can sue in Manhattan in federal court. But if you want the money, we will delegate to the Attorney General of the United States, who in turn will delegate to his designee, an individual, not a committee, not appealed, not subject to review, a person who will decide what each person who files a claim should get and why. And if that person accepts it, they sign a release. They will not sue the airlines or the World Trade Center or the Port Authority or Boeing or anybody else. And over a 33-month period, 97% of all the families that lost a loved one took the money. It averaged tax-free $2 million two million dollars of taxpayer money average per claim. Another 2,300 individuals who were physically injured on 9-11 also opted into the fund and took on average four hundred thousand dollars tax-free. About seven billion dollars of the taxpayers money was expended to pay these claims. Now the fund expired on December 22, 2003. And when it expired, 94 families decided not to take the money. They wanted to sue in federal court. There were also thousands of injured victims who didn't manifest any latent illness until after the fund expired. So they couldn't possibly file a claim. And for years, they litigated until a few months ago, Congress reopened the fund to deal with these people who, in fairness, missed the deadline only because at the time that the deadline expired, they weren't yet, quote, sick, unquote. So they didn't have a claim. And that claim developed, and it developed, and they had no fund, no 9-11 fund, so they had to sue. Congress enacted a law a few months ago to extend, reopen the 9-11 fund for the purpose of dealing with these uh, physically injured claimants. And fortunately for the country and for these claimants, the Attorney General appointed Sheila Birnbaum as the special master to deal with these new revived claims. Nobody better in the country to do this than Sheila. And that is exactly what she's doing now. She will rule the day, but that's another story. <laughs> so, that's the genesis of the fund. That fund, um, Congress, when it enacted the law, didn't say one word. It didn't have time to say one word about some issues that they left to be resolved by the special master. Who applies to the fund representing the dead claimant or the injured victim? Who applies? What do you do? If a spouse disagrees with a fiancé or siblings disagree with a grandfather or a father or a mother, how do you decide who's eligible to assert the claim on behalf of the victim? Congress didn't even deal with that. We had to develop regulations. Now, Congress did provide some help by saying in the law itself, not only the appointing authority, the Attorney General to appoint the special master, no appeals permitted to the courts. The law prohibited that. The law did say that the special master in, in, in calculating damages in individual cases shall take into account the existing tort system and how it works. Economic loss, that's a tort concept. Pain and suffering and emotional distress, a tort concept. Collateral offsets, reducing any gross award by life insurance or other collateral income, 
not a taught concept. It was a hybrid. It was sort of a mishmash. But Congress, in its wisdom, did provide the special master with some guidance as to how you go about calculating awards and damages in individual cases. And over a 33-month period, that's exactly what a staff of about 450 people did. We basically looked at each award, each claim, decided what that victim would have earned over his or her lifetime but for 9-11, what would that person, how old was the person, how many dependents, what was his or her uh, annual income, what did the income project to be? The master at doing this was Mark Muller, who represented scores, maybe hundreds of these claimants, and did it with a skill that made my job much easier. When he came to see me, he had followed the statute. Ken, here is what this victim would have earned, Here's why she was, uh, here are the dependents. Here is the, the facts that will help you calculate the damage. So that's how this worked. And over the 33-month period, we, we processed 7,300 claims and paid out about $7 billion. That, in a 10-minute summary, is part one, the genesis of the program. Now, why was it successful? Well, there are a couple of reasons I think the 9-11 Fund worked. First, unprecedented generosity on the part of the American people. An administrative no-fault system that pays out on average $2 million in a death claim tax-free. You show me a program like that anywhere in American history. Public money. Yes, there are all sorts of administrative no-fault programs in this country. Workers' Comp is a great example. There are other federal statutes that pay um, for damage caused by injury where the federal government has a vested interest. There are a few, not many, reparation programs in American history where, for example, the generation following those who were interned after Pearl Harbor, Japanese American citizens on the West Coast. President Reagan signed a law in 1980 that gave about $20,000 per family. Two million dollars tax-free as an incentive to attract people out of the tort system. Very, very unprecedented. So the generosity of the program is one reason that I believe it works so well. Second, you had an unprecedented amount, I think, of patriotic consensus among the American people that this is something that we want to do, not so much for the victims. I mean, of course we want to help the victims, but we want to demonstrate our collective societal support for the victims. We want to demonstrate to the world our sensitivity, compassion, support for the victims of 9-11. There was a, 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 an opportunity in time where even though an individual is authorizing two, three, five, six million dollars to be paid to an individual victim, the reaction of the American people and its elected officials was largely well done. Thank you. Thank you for your service. And I think one reason for success was the unique environment that followed 9-11 when the country rallied behind efforts not only to attack the, the wrongdoers, those responsible for 9-11, but also to demonstrate its, its utter support politically and financially for the victims of 9-11. Do not underestimate the political importance of that type of support that led to the nation basically rallying around the program. Third, the incredibly important support of the trial lawyers like Mark Muller. 
The trial lawyers in 9-11 voluntarily agreed as soon as the ink, as soon as the president signed the law, the lawyers agreed to get behind the 9-11 fund and to support the effort to compensate. The fund would have never succeeded the way it did if the trial lawyers had been at odds with the very idea of the program. So the fact that the trial lawyers represented about 1,500 families pro bono. From all over the United States, trial lawyers volunteered to help implement the program. It would have never worked without the trial bar, and I will always be in the debt of the trial bar and people like Mark for rallying around the program. Those who did it pro bono, wonderful. But even those lawyers who charged a fee greatly reduced their fees, I think, I don't know, 5 to 10 percent, rather than 25, 33, 40 percent. So the trial lawyers were instrumental in making the program work. And, it, and they, they are to be commended. I still, 10 years later, take every opportunity I can to attend state bar meetings and ABA meetings, basically to thank the trial bar for its efforts in making the program work. So there was some mechanical reasons for success. There were certainly political reasons for success. And my goodness, there were certainly financial reasons for the success of the 9-11 Victim Compensation Fund. Don't forget, the 9-11 Fund was enacted into law without any appropriation. None. Congress, unsure of what it would cost to attract people and demonstrate collegial uh, support, simply said to the Attorney General and to his designee, whatever it takes, you pay it, out of petty cash from the U.S. Treasury. That's how you get paid. All I did was sign an authorization, pay Mrs. Jones three million, off it goes to the U.S. Treasury. There was no appropriation where serious problems would have arisen if Mrs. Jones felt that she was getting paid X because I had to save some money for Y. I didn't have that problem. I didn't have that problem. That's a serious problem. Sheila's confronting that problem. Everybody counts other people's money. Everybody. And in the 9-11 Victim Compensation Fund, I didn't have that problem because there was no appropriation. I had to use my good judgment as to what the, the, um, the public would bear in terms of success in, in payment. Finally, a fourth reason aside from generosity, the lawyers, and political consensus. I learned from Judge Weinstein, you see, in Agent Orange. I learned that it would be very, very important to reach out proactively and make sure that we give everybody an opportunity to be heard, that we give everybody an opportunity to express their opinion, to give everybody an opportunity to, to vent about life's unfairness about life's unfairness. So, what we did, first we promulgated interim rules and we sent out to the world those interim rules and said, here are the rules, what do you think? How can we improve them before we implement them? We received about 2,800 hits. Uh, people writing in and, and, and expressing opinions about the rules as we had drafted them initially. We made some changes and then we said here's the final rule based on what we think is right and also input from a vast outreach program where we went around the country, not only to uh, the Pentagon and New York City, but also those planes, some of them, they were heading for California. We were out in California. We gave Boston, we gave everybody an opportunity to be heard. Then, in implementing the program, we invited any claimant who wanted to the opportunity for a private individual hearing. Again, something I learned from Judge Weinstein in DES litigation. Agent Orange taught me about town hall meetings 
In the old ages, before electronics, with the judge, we went around the country and held hearings and gave people an opportunity to be heard. In 9-11, we not only went around, we not only gave people an opportunity to be heard on the protocol and what we might do, then we told every single claimant, come on in under oath with a transcript, we'll give you an opportunity to be heard. You can vent as much as you want to me about life's unfairness. Do not underestimate the importance of those hearings. Ask Mark Muller about those hearings. He was there. Those hearings were critical to the success of the fund. People came to see me. They didn't really want to talk about money. They came to vent about the curveball that had been thrown them. Mr. Feinberg, thank you for seeing me. I was married to my wife for 25 years. She died at the World Trade Center. I'm here because I want you to know what an angel she was, and I'd like to now play a video of our marriage 25 years ago. Well, Mr. Jones, you can play that. I'll be glad to listen, but you know, that'll have no bearing on the compensation to... I want you to see what those murderers did to my angel. Play the video. Medals, diplomas, certificates of good conduct, ribbons. My office was filled with memorabilia from people who wanted to come and see me just to talk about a lost loved one, to validate the memory of a lost loved one. And I received hundreds of uh, items in connection with, thousands in connection with these hearings. The importance of what the judge calls democratization, what I, what I would say, the importance of outreach to the collective eligibles and the opportunity, voluntary, half the people never came to see me. The other half, about 1,500, did come to see me. The opportunity to be heard. Tremendous reason for success. There we are. Those are the four reasons in summary why I think the program worked as well as it did. Now the final point in the last few minutes. What do we learn from the 9-11 Victim Compensation Fund? Well, I don't want to prejudge what others may say, but I must say in my own personal opinion, what we learn, not much in terms of precedent. If anybody here believes that the 9-11 Victim Compensation Fund is a precedent, for replication, I uh, must respectfully and strongly disagree. I think that the 9-11 fund as it was drafted by Congress is a precedent for nothing. For nothing. The, the reopening of the 9-11 fund is really an afterthought to cover people who should have been eligible and would have been paid under the original 9-11 fund, but for um, um, the fact that they didn't manifest any injury in time. It's almost an epilogue to uh, the original fund. But I must say, I see absolutely not the slightest evidence that, there is, that the 9-11 fund stands as a precedent for dealing with mass claims. There was no 9-11 fund for Katrina. There was no 9-11 fund for uh, Oklahoma City. There was no 9-11 fund for the Joplin tornadoes and the uh, Tuscaloosa, Alabama tornadoes. Earthquakes, floods. Where is there any evidence at all that the basic assumption of the 9-11 fund, public taxpayer money, tax-free, very generous, paid to eligible claimants. No. There may be some variations on the 9-11 fund, but the variations swallow up the basic characteristics of the 9-11 fund. It was a unique response to an unprecedented historical event. And if Professor Rabin and Professor Molinix and others want to talk about the 9-11 Fund and Tony Seabock in their classroom, that's fine. But it would better be taught in a history class as part of a historical discussion of 9-11 and what it meant to the country. 
because I really don't believe that there will be another 9-11 fund in which the taxpayer, not a private tort visa, steps up and funds a program with the generosity of 9-11. I've seen no indication of it, and I believe my final point is this Pan take, let, let the panel then take over. My final point. I think the 9-11 fund should be a singular event. I think it should not be replicated. It should not be a, um, a, um, um, a symbol or it should not be a precedent from which we try and replicate the fund. Because you see, in this country, I think personally the tort system that Mark Muller champions works pretty well in most cases. Occasionally, five times for me in maybe the last 35 years, there is a, a groundswell or public policy makers decide that there ought to be a different way, like BP for example, which isn't taxpayer money at all, it's private money. And the BP program is established by policymakers, and they decide that's what they want done, so we do it. But I think the 9-11 fund can only be understood, really, in the context of the times. It's rivaled in American history only by the American Civil War, Pearl Harbor, the assassination of President Kennedy, and the 9-11 attacks. And I think if you view that as sort of a historical anomaly, you get around an awful lot of Bob Rabin's um, arguments, pro and con, about the 9-11 fund, uh, or Sheila Birnbaum, or Linda Mullenix, because it seems to me at the end of the day, it's rather theoretical. I don't see it being replicated. And since it's not being replicated, I think a history hat probably makes a great deal more impact and more sense in evaluating the 9-11 11 fund than um, um, a view from, uh, from, from tort law or, or other um, legal approaches. History is a better guide. You see, it's very, very difficult for me to explain to a citizen who lost someone in Oklahoma City or Katrina, why not me, Mr. Feinberg? I lost my husband in the floods in Katrina. Why aren't I eligible for a 9-11 fund? I lost my son in Oklahoma City. Where's my check? I lost my son on the USS Cole, a victim of suicide bombers. How come I'm not eligible? Mr. Feinberg, I don't get it. Last year, my wife saved three little girls from drowning in the Mississippi River, and then she drowned a heroine. Where's my check? You better be very, very careful when you set up these publicly funded funds that tell a very few people who are the victims of life's misfortune, you get $2 million tax-free. All you other people, all you others who have a curveball thrown at you, no, no, you're not eligible. Even if your wife died in the 1993 attacks on the World Trade Center, committed by the very same people, you're not eligible. Congress didn't include you. It raises serious problems of elitism, egalitarianism, etc. Bad things happen to good people every day in this country, and there's not a 9-11 fund available. So I, despite the fact that I'm heavily involved in these funds, as Tony says, I am very wary, sometimes weary, but very wary, of using these funds as some sort of wedge into major changes in tort law. Instead, I think we learn a lot from these funds about our character and our heritage and the way we go about solving problems, but I don't see them as sort of a replacement for 200 years of tort and the rule of law. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you.
thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Miriam Gillis, and I'm going to introduce the panelists uh, today. So um, right to the right of, uh, of Ken is uh, Judge Jack Weinstein, who's a senior district judge in the Eastern District of New York, uh, regarded as one of the most influential judges uh, in this country, especially in the Mass Torts area, where he's been very um, active and creative. Uh, to uh, the judge's right is um, Professor Robert Rabin, the Calder Mackey Professor of Law at Stanford Law School, uh, an ex expert in tort law and compensation systems. Uh, to uh, Professor Rabin's right is uh, Sheila Birnbaum, already noted. Uh, Sheila is um, the current special master for the second 9-11 Victim Compensation Fund. Um, she's a partner at Skadden Arps and, um, and a co-head of the firm's Mass Torts and Insurance Group. Uh, to her right, Professor John Goldberg um, of Harvard Law School, an expert in tort law with particular interest in the sort of philosophical and jurisprudential underpinnings uh, of tort law. And then uh, Mark Moeller, um, who I feel like we already all know, a uh, partner at Kreinler & Kreinler, uh, whose firm uh, handled numerous cases arising out of 9-11 uh, and was the plaintiff's liaison counsel in the tort litigation that's pending uh, before the Southern District of New York. Uh, and then we have Linda Mullinex from um, uh, uh, Texas Law School. She's the Rita and Morris Atlas Chair in Advocacy at the University of Texas at Austin uh, and a leading authority in mass tort litigation. Um, and then finally, Roger Parloff, senior writer for Fortune Magazine. Uh, so thank you all. This really is, as the Dean said, a dream team. Um, uh, and I also just wanted to note that we, um, Tony and I, will be coordinating uh, the comments. Um, and we'll leave time for Q&A from the audience. So we will uh, turn around and try to get your questions uh, before the end of the session, which is uh, slated to run till about 5 p.m. Um, and because the judge has to leave early, I'm going to give uh, Judge Weinstein the first, uh, the first comment. And then we'll, we'll ask the panelists if they have anything uh, to say about Ken's comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> I'm not sure I agree with Ken uh, that this is sui generis. Most of you here are law students, and uh, you're trained now to think and analyze in terms of substantive law and policy and procedural law. And I think uh, that in analyzing uh, what we've learned about this series of 9-11 cases and uh, related cases has to be uh, differentiated at least along those lines. Uh, there are many uh, disasters uh, that are occurring and will occur in this country uh, that are perhaps not so striking. Uh, it is a disaster when uh, air and the water is polluted and people die or are sickened. It is a disaster in a Zyprexa case that I have now where 30,000 people have claimed that uh, a number of uh, unforeseen consequences have made them seriously ill. Now, however the tort system addresses this substantively, that is whether we use the concept of negligence or strict liability or recklessness or some kind of a compensation scheme like a workers' compensation or uh, perhaps the children's vaccine uh, scheme, or project out into possible da disasters that have not yet occurred. For example, the Price-Anderson bill uh, made it possible to build our atomic energy uh, system in this country uh, by providing that uh, the atomic energy industry would pay a limited amount, and beyond that, the government, in effect, uh, would be responsible under some form of uh, tort law, strict liability. We haven't had anything but Three Mile Island in this country, but visualize the uh, Japanese disaster occurring in New York, just a few miles from the city. Uh, how would that be handled? <coughs> what do we learn from 9-11 and uh, from these related statutes, of which we have a considerable number? 
Let me focus on the uh, procedural aspect. I'm not an expert in tort law, and I really don't care much about it, uh, because uh, in these cases that I have, I follow Llewellyn, Carl Llewellyn's uh, dictum. You have to get a sense for the situation, and then you have to approach it in a way that's pragmatic and sensible in view of the sociology and the politics <coughs> and the technology and other aspects of life that we all have to deal with. But we deal with them here on a massive scale, not on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Now, from a procedural point of view, I think we learn a lot from 9-11. I start with my own first uh, semi-mass cases, the various educational segregation cases where I found it necessary to go out into the field and talk to the parents and students and observe the, the schools in order to get a feel for what it was that was bothering people and to appoint special masters where necessary to bridge the gap and explain to the people who would be affected what the problems were and if possible to get them to work together in order to achieve a solution. Not far different, although on a much smaller scale, perhaps, than what Ken faced. In the Agent Orange case, we dealt with a serious political and sociological and medical problem where the proof available was not sufficient under the tort law to permit liability probably in any case, but where there was a political situation that was serious and where the veterans involved felt that they had been abused. Now, from a substantive point of view, choice of law, compensation. I cut through all that mess. I just ignored it. With respect to choice of law, I found what my conflicts teacher would have failed me in in case instead of giving me an A+. Plus, if he had known I was going to come up with this, he would have given me an F. But there was a consensus that all the people from all of the states and all the countries involved fighting shoulder to shoulder should face the same substantive law which permitted me to handle it as a single case. And uh, from a substantive point of view, I said it didn't make any difference that there wasn't enough proof to show more than a probability that the defendants had been negligent because there was negligent, and I could assume a certain percentage of the people who had cancers and other things was due to their exposures. So I provided for putting all of that in the pot, if I knew who was really injured, and then dividing it in an insurance policy and in a 50-state social security problem, uh, program for all of the families. Now, that, it seems to me, was a sensible way of dealing with it. Critical to the approach was what Ken referred to as our outreach program. It was essential to go out and talk to the veterans and get a feel for what was bothering them and what the politics would permit and for devising a program with the aid of groups of veterans and social workers and others that would accomplish something that was useful with the limited amount of funds that we had then, 300 million by today's standards, a pittance hardly worth uh, talking about. Now, it's called pocket oh, it's called pocket change, right. To, Today I'm faced with a different kind of problem. 
in connection with cases like Zyprexa, Lilly against Lilly, where people who took a drug that had very great benefits, but had unexpected or perhaps expected uh, consequences, weight, enormous weight gain, diabetes, and damages. How to handle that? Now, that I did not handle successfully from my point of view, because I never saw a single one of the plaintiffs. All of the cases were settled by the attorneys using uh, special masters. Ken was one, and for uh, uh, standards that would permit a rational settlement and providing for the combina combination through the multi-district litigation oh. panel of the aggregation of cases from all over the country. Now that provided a basis for settlement, partially on the tort system. But it was very unsatisfactory from my point of view because I never saw any of these plaintiffs. I never had a feel for them the way I had a feel for those who had been educationally disadvantaged or for those children who I met out in Suffolk who were sitting in their own urine on cold floors while the system responsible for them was watching television through the AIDS. That was a different kind of problem because I saw it, I understood the litigation, I was able to accomplish what needed to be done there, which was to close those institutions up and set up another system. Now the problem from the point of view of the Zeprexa cases is that not only did I, as the presiding judge, not have a feel for their situation, but these 30,000 litigants never had a sense of the court. My court, my district court, is the human face of federal law. We deal with people. We deal with trying to solve their problems and trying to do less harm than good. We deal with all of the individual and group problems in massive cases of these, this kind, whether they be the asbestos cases where I tried 70 of the cases in the Brooklyn Navy Yard and therefore understood what mesothelioma meant and what these people were feeling and what their families were feeling. But in many of these other cases, where the litigants themselves need to be involved, need to have the sense that they're not set off in their mere ciphers being handled with their problems by attorneys who are in many cases faceless. Attorneys are handling a thousand or more cases at a time in these mass cases. They don't uh, very often explain what happens. We have had brilliant attorneys, such as in DES, where the attorney went out and explained to the women and had the women get together. And uh, do you know what DES is? I'm sorry. That's the uh, uh, diethylstilvestrol that uh, women who were pregnant took and that affected their daughter's uh, reproductive systems. And these daughters got together with the aid of their brilliant attorney and worked together and they came in and I explained it to them and I began to understand what was going on with them. So that this problem of what I call democratization of these mass cases, whether they're 9-11 cases or any of these other cases that uh, we have to deal with, requires that we use modern techniques, social networking, broadcasting of trials and of arguments, grouping together of the people who are affected. Mel Weiss, for example, a great uh, lawyer in mass torts who unfortunately uh, 
fell into uh, some ethical problems. In one large case out in California, actually retained a great civil proceduralist uh, teaching at NYU. What's his name? Uh, uh, the great uh, Arthur Miller. Uh, to go out and explain to these people what the problems were and how they might handle it. Now, how do we get in these mass cases that sense of participation? How do we get our judges and our attorneys to explain and treat these people as important individuals in their own right? How do we get the judges to get a sense of the situation so that they can cut through in settlements very often the theoretical tort law uh, problems that inhibit a sensible approach that get away from mere compensation and money to the development and the safety of whole communities through equity concepts and the like. Those are the problems that bother me. And it seems to me that in 9-11 and in the Gulf case, Sheila and Ken and Judge Alvin Hellestein, by reaching out to the community of people that were so deeply affected and felt that nobody cared until these people reached out to them and tried to explain and tried to bring them in and tried to get them together. Now, there's the consequence of doing that is that these cases become much more difficult to deal with. It's all very good for somebody to go out and make a settlement of a thousand cases and not explain anything but hire somebody as the lawyer has to do to divide it up in an equitable manner. But what do you do when you get those thousand people to think about what they want to do and half of them are irrational and half of them have weird ideas about their case being worth billions? How do you bring that public into the case without breaking down the system? The hierarchical system that we have developed that treats clients in these mass disasters as ciphers, as people who are entitled to money and little else. That's the problem that's been bothering me, and that's why I think that my treatment of Zyprexa, although we've settled over 30,000 cases, and this is the last thing I'll say, was not successful because I don't think they understood, I don't think I understood, I think we can do better, and I think we now have the technological tools to do better. Well, I, I don't know if I can hear, I wanted to interrupt for a second because I couldn't help but feel Judge Weinstein and, and Special Master Feinberg that listening to both of you talk about the uh, key feature of these large programs, large litigation, it's ironic that it becomes the individual relationship between the adjudicator and the, uh, and the claimant that becomes the sort of unique contrast with what we call normal law. And that means, leads me to want to talk, look, turn to John Goldberg, because I want to ask uh, Professor Goldberg, John, my co-author, I mean, do you feel listening to this that what gets lost as we achieve greater, greater success in making the public seem satisfied with the product is law. I mean, what's being drained out of this is law. Maybe what's being inserted is some human touch, uh, judgment from excellent men and women who have good judgment, but law is being removed, and that might, be, might have consequences which are unanticipated consequences. John, I, I have to leave I, at 3.30, <laughs> and it's not because I don't want to listen to you, because as my former clerk, you know, I listen to every word. <laughs> So I'll stay for five minutes. Sum it up quickly. <laughs> In fact, that's true. All of you, we're going to have all the time for all of you to talk if we all keep it relatively so brief. Let me yeah. say very quickly, I've, I've had the great uh, honor and privilege to uh, work closely both with uh, Judge Weinstein as his law clerk and uh, 
Ken Feinberg uh, in a consultant I capacity. And I have uh, the highest regard uh, for their extraordinary talents as lawyers, their extraordinary patriotism uh, to the country, and their um, uh, extraordinary service on behalf of so many people who have benefited from their deep commitment to justice. So let me preface my remarks with that. Uh, um, I think, um, although the, the judge and I have a, have a sort of long-standing uh, personal battle, which need not concern you over just uh, what judges do and what law is, but um, and he wins because he's the judge. But um, uh, I do think some of uh, in some of the judge's comments where he said this isn't you know law in the traditional sense, this is helping people uh, and deal with their problems. Well, absolutely, and nobody's better at it than him. But of course, um, we heard him say things like, well, remember in Agent Orange, there wasn't uh, sufficient proof to establish a causal connection between uh, the manufacturer's uh, alleged design defects or failures to warn and the individual claimant's um, uh, damages. Well, that's, a, that, that's the law. Uh, that's the law at work. There's a, a, a legal rule which says, in ordinary circumstances, uh, the individual does have to make a certain kind of showing on causation. Now, that doesn't mean that thoughtful judges and thoughtful lawyers in negotiating settlements or supervising settlements um, shouldn't try and find a way to deal with some of these problems short of going to a jury trial and getting a definitive resolution in particular individual claims about who can prove causation and who can't, but it does set the backdrop against which uh, these conversations are going. So the only thing I would say, Tony, in response directly to your question, and then I'll shut up, is um, that um, often the law is working and doing a lot of work quietly, even in these uh, Weinsteinian, Feinbergian conversations in which they are doing an enormous amount uh, to help individuals who have been through horrible ordeals and are, are currently dealing with horrible ordeals. The law is there, um, and the law is often doing a lot of work in setting uh, the terms of the conversation, what claimants can expect to get out of, a judicial proceeding, an audience with Judge Weinstein, will the audience result in them hearing, well, actually, the law can't do anything for you, um, but I'm going to try and help you. That's a very different message than you have a strong claim, and then there's an interesting question of how to settle it. Okay, we're going to start trying coordinating among all of you. Please gesture to us in some way with your eyes, your fingers, whatever. Sheila. Before Judge Weinstein goes, I mean, unfortunately, um, there aren't that many Judge Weinstein does what he does, where he listens and where he tries to come up with a, a resolution that works uh, for the participants. Um, and uh, I just would like to echo some of, um, some of uh, Ken's remarks uh, and just throw into this hopper uh, for comment by the panel the new VCF, Victims Compensation Fund, because some of the issues that Ken didn't have to confront are going to have to be confronted in this new plan, which in some ways has been built and will be built on the incredible foundation that Ken set up, and we are building on that foundation. But we have a lot of differences in this new fund, which is going to test a great deal of what happened in the first fund. Firstly, Ken had an unlimited amount of money. We have a limited fund of $2.7 billion. Secondly, we have our administrative costs coming out of the fund. Uh, Ken had an unlimited amount of money for administrative costs. Thirdly, Ken confronted 7,000 applications. I think maybe we'll get that in the first month. Uh, and it, it's, it's going to be a different level of claims, but substantially different in a way that we can't engage in the kinds of conversations that Ken had and his staff had, which to me were very important. I was appointed by Judge Ellerstein to be the special master to settle the cases that went into the courthouse. And Mark worked again with Mark and some remarkable plaintiff lawyers as well. There, too, the crux of getting those cases settled were for the families to tell their stories 
about their loved ones. And without that period of time, which took a huge amount of time, sometimes two and three meetings with the family, with the mementos, with their anger and their grief and their frustration, we would have never had those settlements without going through that process in Boston and Washington and New York and elsewhere. So now we're confronted with a bond where we can't do that. I mean, every we can't speak to thousands of people or thousands of lawyers. This new fund is going to have to be on the basis of computerizing the the information, computerizing the economic models that that Ken started and bringing them up to date, creating a very different environment. And it's going to be interesting to see if we can build the trust that Ken was able to build both with the lawyers and the claimants and the litigants in a way that made it work. Now, this is far different. We're dealing with different injuries. We're dealing with latency. A big issue right now for our fund is going to be cancer. Is cancer going to be included as a compensable injury? And what cancers? I mean, we have now had this concept that cancer is one thing. There are so many different cancers. Some of them, there may be more evidence of relationship to exposure. We are not applying a Daubert standard or an evidentiary standard of the courts to determine what injuries would be included. We're looking at what is reasonably scientific and medical evidence. But these issues are going to test the metal of whether any fund can be successful when you are dealing with these kinds elements. Uh, limited fund, a large number of claimants uh, with injuries that some of them are covered and some of them aren't. And so, um, and I'd love to hear from Mark on his comments on, on this, who's you know, really been involved in this from the beginning. Uh, first, let me say that uh, it's really a pleasure to be on the same panel as Judge Weinstein, Sheila, and Judge Weinstein. I, I haven't had the pleasure of meeting the other people on the panel, but these are people that I know very well, and to be sitting at the same table with them is really quite an honor. They have distinguished themselves, and they've done a service for the country that is simply extraordinary. I, I have the distinction of being one of the few people to sue Ken Feinberg, <laughs> challenging his authority and the scope of his discretion in the victim's lost. compensation board, <laughs> and I lost. Not, not entirely. <laughs> I flew out to California the night before I filed a lawsuit because he was mediating a case in Huntington Beach. The car that picked me up at the hotel went to the wrong hotel in the first instance, so our dinner started at about a quarter to ten, but he was sitting there very patiently waiting for me, and I told him I was going to sue him the next day because the discretion that he described as being the scope of his authority under the statute, I said, destroyed that discretion because if you didn't know what he was going to do and you had no right of appeal, how could people make a choice as to whether they were going to go into the fund? So that he, he asked for too much. Judge Hellerstein upheld uh, Ken's the scope of discretion, but I think implicit in the opinion was the admonition that he had to be fair and that arbitrariness could not be decided until the judge saw the facts. And I must say that when I stood up and said that when the task was over, when Ken finished his job, the country would be in his debt, I was 100% right. He has done an extraordinary, ex extraordinary job, and I'm sure Sheila will follow in his footsteps. But, but I want to explain something. The success of the fund, the reason so many people went into the fund is because they were afraid. They were fearful of the consequences of not going into the fund. The question is why? First, Ken, in, in his outreach mode and trying to sell the fund, kept on saying, you're crazy if you litigate. You're, you're crazy. It'll take you 10 years. You'll never get any money. <laughs> 
Right. 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 That's what he said. <laughs> it's state after state in parlor meeting in town. You're crazy if you, with the Brockton accent pounding at the country. So people, first of all, got that message. Second, at that point in time, in the, furl in the early months following 9-11, the finger of blame was pointing at the government. Why didn't the CIA, the FBI, connect the dots? The airlines were almost considered innocents early on, and nobody knew the scope of airline negligence or malfeasance. Why? Because Judge Hellerstein, who was holding the reins to the litigation, the cases that had started, postponed discovery. So nobody could figure out what the landscape of liability might be. So if a client is sitting in my office before the statute of limitations on a death case runs in, December 2000, in September 2003 and said to me, what should I do? Should I litigate or not? I said, I can't promise you the outcome. In I don't even know what it is. And here we are 10 years later and the case has not yet been tried. So my fear, my fear, communicated to my clients in as honest a way as I could was, I don't know what to tell you. I do know one thing. If we file a claim with Ken Feinberg's victim's compensation, you'll get some money. You might get more in a litigation mode if we win, but I can't tell you today that we're going to win. So the sure bet versus the iffy bet is what drove people into the, into the fund. Now, is the fund, was the fund the right thing to do? At that point in time, in the context, in the historical context in which it occurred, of course. When, when Ken says there'll never be another victim's compensation run like this, he's absolutely right, because hopefully there won't be another 9-11. But the administrative mechanism for resolving mass torts is now part of the fabric of the legal system, like it or not. Now, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. When Ken says there'll never be another one like it, BP is not it, but it is like it. Ken has broad range of authority to administer the money. There aren't any limits on really what he can spend. There's no appeal. You give up your right to sue. So there's similarities. Is it identical? I don't know. But I, 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 I could go on, but the context here is the Victim Compensation Fund worked. Sheila's challenge is different, it's harder. The litigation model is, in my judgment, better if when you are giving advice to the client, you can give a fair analysis of what the opportunities are in litigation and whether they are more likely to win than to lose. Then the client can make a choice. If you don't know what that is, you cannot tell them to put all their money on black because it could come up red. Linda, do you want to follow up on that? So much to say. You might want to use the <laughs> mic over there. This one. Use Roger's mic. Yeah. Okay. Um, this yeah. is my mic. That's your mic. <laughs> yeah, but did you pay for this mic? <laughs> <laughs> you have to be old to know that reference. Okay. Um, I, I just have a number of responses to a lot of things that have been said. Um, actually, and Judge Weinstein has left, but Ken Feinberg might remember this. Um, 10 years ago, and it was about uh, 10 or 11 days after the, um, the events down at the World Trade Center, um, we were all convened in New York at Brooklyn Law School um, in celebration of Judge Weinstein's 80th birthday. And there was a round table then, and Congress had just enacted the statute um, for the Victims Compensation Fund, but the special master had not yet um, been chosen. And I remember sitting at this table, I was one of the participants in this, and there was much discussion of the statute, and somebody at the table said, well, it's all very predictable. Ken Feinberg will be chosen as the special master, and Linda Mullinex will spend the rest of her life writing about this, <laughs> <laughs> so, which kind of has turned out to be true. I'm one of the, the few people on this panel, actually, who has not worked on any piece of this, or an Agent Orange or any of these settlements um, or on the Gulf Coast Claims Facility. So I'm completely um, a, a neutral, independent, um, uh, basically academic um, commentator on uh, all of these. And it's from that posture um, I, I want to uh, communicate my comments. 
Um, one of the many of the things that um, Ken Feinberg said are of great interest to me. Um, he said that the the, um, the World uh, Trade Center Victims Compensation Fund and and what happened with that should be taught in a history class um, and and not in law schools. Um, with all due respect, I beg to differ. I really think it is highly appropriately um, taught in law school because um, for students, I think it raises the question of um, when we have these mass disasters or these mass accidents or these mass torts, what's an appropriate way for dealing with them and resolving them? And beyond that, um, how do we go about assessing success? And uh, Ken Farber gave us a number of metrics by which he judges success. But I would ask the students in here, um, are there other questions we should be asking? And is it just a counting exercise? Is it enough to say 97% of the claimants came into the fund and they took X amount uh, in compensation? And I would ask you to think about broader questions, which is, how do we assess justice? Okay, what is justice? What, what, is, what is fairness? Um, and I think those are appropriate. Um, overarching questions, and particularly since um, in this country we are overwhelmingly concerned with the rule of law um, and due process, and, and so I just want to suggest those might be other um, uh, possible framing questions um, for thinking um, about funds. Um, I also, by way of um, personal biography, I really have spent my entire life um, in, in the academic study of how, how do you resolve mass torts and mass disasters. I thought the Dean's opening comment was a very appropriate, and I teach this, and I told my students I think the course should be named Doom and Gloom, um, because that's, what, that's the subject matter of what you're doing, right? Mass disaster, mass accidents, and then how do you um, resolve injured, uh, paying out some kind of uh, remediation to injured claimants. And over the arc of doing this, um, initially I was a big fan and advocate of the class action settlement approach. And, and I thought um, that was a pretty good mechanism. But over time, I, I became less enamored, um, and I thought that there were tremendous problems uh, in, in the class action settlement approach um, to doing this. Um, and was looking around, was, was there some other way of resolving these? And I actually looked outside the United States and um, discovered that um, in, in other civil law countries, one way of doing this was through fund approaches. And then I became especially enamored of thinking about fund approaches to resolving mass torts and mass disasters. And when the World Trade Center events occurred and Congress passed the Victims' Compensation Fund, I thought, well, this is going to be very, very interesting because now we will have a congressionally enacted fund approach and we'll finally get to see um, the implementation of this and how this works. And so I had this kind of initial rush of, this is really good. But we're now 10 years removed um, from the creation of the fund and the implementation of the fund. And it took a while. Um, it took about five years out before some more critical commentary um, began to be developed in the academic literature. And I want to suggest to you that there really is a very, very large and substantial body of academic literature which has critically examined um, the uh, implementation of the World Trade Center Fund, um, uh, which talks about many, many different aspects, um, not only of how it was set up, but how it was implemented once the statute was created and the special master um, uh, was uh, appointed. And so that gave me some pause in reading that, that body um, of, of academic commentary. And then uh, the, we had the, uh, the BP Gulf oil spill, and the Gulf Coast Claims Facility was set up. And I was very interested to hear Ken Feinberg say today, and he has said this over and over and over again. I've actually read almost everything Ken Feinberg has written and almost all the talks he's given, and he says over and over and over again, as he did today, that uh, the World Trade Center events are sui generis, not to be repeated, the fund is a one-time event, national calamity, Pearl Harbor, he's got them all, assassination of Kennedy, all the way down the line and it's not to be a model for anything and never to be repeated ever again. But if you look very closely at what has happened with the creation uh, and implementation of the Gulf Coast Claims Facility, almost everything that Ken Feinberg has done as administrator of the Gulf Coast Claims Facility replicates and is derivative of his experience um, with the World Trade Center Fund. And um, I have never done this before, but I'm going to do it today. 
Um, I, I probably have written, it's the only article that's out there that compares the World Trade Center Fund to the Gulf Coast Claims Facility. Um, it's about 100 pages long. It's been published in the Louisiana Law Review. That's not by way of plug, but it's out there to tell you that there really is a very, very lengthy <coughs> analysis um, and a critique of, of these two funds. And the point of my article, it's called uh, Gulf Coast Claims Facility as a Means for Resolving Mass Tort Claims of Fund Too Far. And here's my concern that um, in this article I say that Ken Feinberg's own career for me captures the arc of what has been going on with the resolution of mass tort claims. And so he basically began um, his illustrious career uh, as a special master in Agent Orange. And that was a class action settlement uh, under the authority of Judge Weinstein um, to deal with the Agent Orange claimants. And that represents a model of a fund approach uh, uh, under the um, uh, under a rule of law, under the class action rules, subject to the constraints and requirements of a class action settlement. Then we move to the model of the World Trade Center uh, Victims Compensation Fund, which was authorized by um, congressional statute, and uh, there was uh, public notice and comment rulemaking, although um, once after the public notice and comment rulemaking that Ken Farnberg described to you, um, in my article I talk about there was a lot of kind of on the fly ad hoc rulemaking uh, in administration of the Victims Compensation Fund. Um, anyway, it, it's a model that's once removed from the class action settlement model um, and, and I think um, has a lot of um, uh, points in the implementation um, that are rightly subject to criticism. And then we move to the Gulf Coast Claims Facility, uh, facility which is not authorized by law. It's not authorized by congressional statute. It was not set up at all uh, in the same way that the Victims Compensation Fund was. Um, and uh, it, it basically, um, uh, I, I think it's problematic in the way it's been structured and the way it's been administered uh, and uh, lack of reviewability, lack of accountability, lack of transparency, a whole bunch of other problems. And so it seems to me on this arc of three different models of resolving mass tort claims, we've moved away from a regime of attempting to settle these under a rule of law to a model now that is not subject to the rule of law and that I think is, is on a trend towards almost lawless resolution of these claims. And I think that's a problem of tremendous, tremendous concern and something that we all need to be talking about. So do uh, you have a question to ask or should we try and bring out uh, Bob and, and Roger? We prepared questions. Let's hear from Bob and, yeah, and yeah. Roger. Yeah. Let's hear from Bob and then yeah, I would like to comment on. Yeah, yeah. Um, if uh, on, on Linda's point um, and uh, Ken Feinberg would probably be the better one to address it, but I, I, the things that I thought might be <clears throat> unfair about that argument is, is two things are missing. One is that the, the Gulf Coast Claims Facility, as I understand it, is entirely voluntary. If you want the, the tort system, you've got it. That wasn't exactly the case with 9-11 because they said, yeah, you've got the tort system, but we're limiting liability uh, to uh, uh, what what you're insured for, and um, uh, and so there you were, there was a taking, and and constitutionally you had to give something in 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 response, and they created this. Here the tort system exists, and anybody who th you know wants to say, yeah, I'd like to roll the dice with. Uh, the tort system, see how it does. I do in 10 years, it, it, it can do that, and they are doing that. And those that want to say, I'll roll the dice with Ken Feinberg and see what I, you know, am entitled to in a, in a year, um, can do that. Uh, and they even get to find out the offer first before they choose. So, um, the, the other thing that's slightly unfair is that there is a congressional statute. Uh, that applies. It's, it's called the Oil Pollution Act or something, OPA. And uh, it creates a weird uh, 
vague system that, as I understand it, has never been applied before uh, because the situation has never really arisen. Certainly, it's never been applied to anything like what happened in the Gulf. And, and uh, that is what Congress has told us to do and BP to do. And so BP is supposed to initially take responsibility and get claims, take claims before you can go to court, I think. Um, or, or I, well, I, 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 can't, I can't speak to the details of it. But they are supposed to do this. And so they, they did a logical thing. They said, well, we're going to get Ken, Ken Feinberg to handle this administrative part of the phase. Um, make the, give this some credibility. Uh, if people don't want to do it, they don't have to. Um, so uh, that's my immediate res response to that. I had one other comment. And I, this goes off maybe in a different direction, which is the uh, as for the uniqueness of the fund. There's a there's a uh, uh, of the original fund. Uh, I agree that it's unique and. Um, there's sort of an obvious distinction between it and all of the almost all of the mass torts we deal with, which is that usually in a mass tort, the defendant or all the defendants or any of the plausible defendants are being charged with negligence or gross negligence or maybe recklessness or maybe even homic uh, you know negligent homicide, but but they're very. I, I haven't heard of one where they're being charged with intentionally, you know, trying to kill as many of us as they can and plotting it out for two years and thinking how can we circumvent all of the existing safeguards that people thought reasonable right up until September 10th. And when you do that, all of these, gen these all of our general principles of, you know, joint tort feasors should be, I mean, uh, jointly and severally liable and, and concepts of comparative fault are sort of pushed to the breaking point. And you can say, and, and you know, good lawyers can ethically make arguments that, yeah, American Airlines should share responsibility, but at some point, uh, it's, it, it doesn't, to say that Al-Qaeda is 90% responsible and, and American Airlines is 5% responsible and, and Port Authority is 2% and, and in a way it's, 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 it, 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 it's offensive and at that, certainly at that point of history it was divisive and it was un, unproductive for a country that's trying to pull together uh, and respond to, to a common enemy to to begin sniping at these very peripheral, uh, in the in the grand scheme of things, defendants. Uh, Bob. Yeah, we've um, <coughs> we, we've uh, tilted uh, slightly uh, towards um, uh, the Gulf Coast Claims Facility, and I, I'd like to take it back uh, away from there. I, I think that the Gulf Coast Claims Facility uh, is fascinating phenomenon. Uh, I hope to write on it uh, at some point. Sure you will. <laughs> further down the line. Uh, but uh, if uh, the 9-11 structure was sui generis, uh, this one is super sui generis. Uh, President Obama and BP coming together to appoint a special master, I, I don't regard that as a model uh, for the future. Um, so uh, what I would like to do uh, is uh, offer a little bit of a retrospective, and it will cover some of the things that have already been said on the victim's compensa Victim Compensation Fund itself and whether that uh, is uh, a model for the future. Uh, to begin with, the fund, or really the statute that established the fund, um, uh, was, uh, uh, was uh, seriously under-inclusive. Um, and in a way, it's Monday uh, morning, morning uh, quarterbacking uh, to uh, talk about uh, the fact that toxic exposure victims uh, at that point uh, weren't, uh, uh, weren't uh, 
brought within the eligibility requirements. But uh, in fact, uh, I won't uh, depart too far from uh, the strictures of modesty, but I did write an article in the Virginia Law Review one year later in 2002 that was exclusively on that topic. That is, that the fund was um, inappropriately uh, under-inclusive, that it wasn't justified uh, to leave out toxic exposure victims, long latency victims. At that point, um, and, uh, and that uh, the structure could have been uh, written uh, in a way that would have uh, set up uh, a uh, long-term trust uh, with uh, targeted points in time where there was an evaluation of long latency claims um, and, uh, and they could have been, the long latency victims could have been included uh, in the, uh, uh, in the uh, 2001 victim compensation. But the fact is, um, and everyone's aware of this, they simply weren't on the radar screen politically 11 days after the disaster. Uh, and that's the simple and straightforward explanation for why toxic exposure victims, uh, even though they should have been included really at that point in time, uh, they weren't. Um, but we do now have uh, the Zadroga amendments uh, and we have Sheila Birnbaum um, and that's going to address that category of victims. So that's the link, really, between uh, the 2001 fund and what now, much later, but appropriately, uh, has been uh, put on the books, uh, the, um, the amended version of the fund uh, that, that will consider the claims of first responders and other uh, toxic exposure uh, victims. Now, the Victim Compensation Fund also failed to provide uh, for eligibility, uh, as Ken mentioned, uh, uh, for uh, past and present victims at that time uh, of other terrorist uh, events. Past victims, like the Oklahoma City uh, victims, again, uh, they simply weren't on the radar screen 11 days after 9-11. Uh, um, and perhaps the exclusion of those victims can be justified weakly uh, through the singularity of 9-11, but I would underscore weakly. Um, as far as uh, future uh, uh, terrorist events are concerned and the appropriateness of the 9-11 structure, um, I, I think Singularity, again, in the sense that Ken described it, linking it to Pearl Harbor and other, and a handful of other traumatic events, uh, perhaps as a basis, perhaps uh, for distinguishing Hurricane Katrina victims. There were, after all, a thousand uh, deaths uh, from Hurricane uh, Katrina. You don't hear much about that. Um, and other non-terrorist uh, disasters involving death and disability, uh, perhaps uh, they can be uh, distinguished. But terrorism, per se, it seems to me, and here I agree with Ken, it's not a convincing category uh, for, uh, a persuasive category, for me at least, for establishing a uh, no-fault scheme in uh, mass death and injury cases, and we can point to any number of life's tragedies, from Hurricane Katrina to the Rhode Island nightclub fire a few years ago to, uh, to you name it, hurricanes and, uh, and earthquakes that are going to occur in the future. Uh, and, and the fact is that one uh, way of thinking about the inappropriateness of the 9-11 of, the, of an administrative compensation scheme is to think a little bit more precisely about what we mean by mass terrorist events or mass disasters. Um, and I think uh, even at a first cut, uh, we would have to create three different categories. Uh, terrorist type events uh, like 9-11, uh, man-made uh, disasters, uh, uh, of, which, uh, of which we have many, uh, like British Petroleum, BP, um, and natural disasters, uh, like hurricanes and earthquakes. 
and some, perhaps a fourth category that is a combination of man-made and natural, uh, like Hurricane Katrina, uh, where perhaps the Army Corps of Engineers does and should have borne, uh, should bear uh, toward responsibility. Um, and even that sort of a division uh, isn't uh, sufficient or adequate because just within the category of terrorist uh, triggered uh, disasters, um, one has to, 9-11 may be sui generis, uh, but what about um, a subway or stadium uh, bombing that kills a, a, a very substantial number of people? Or what about the kinds of problems uh, that a country like Israel or, um, uh, or um, uh, Northern Ireland uh, or uh, the entire Middle East at this point uh, faces. That is just kind of random terrorist bombings of grocery stores, marketplaces, you name it. Um, it seems to me that, uh, that, uh, that we can't uh, have a constant proliferation of single event no fault schemes that covers all of these uh, all of these uh, terrorist uh, calamities. Uh, nor can we, I think, but it would, it would take a long time, and I won't take the time to spell this out. Nor can we sensibly put them all under the umbrella of an ongoing terrorist scheme. <coughs> and again, that pushes at why terrorism should be the limit rather than including events. Uh, like Hurricane Katrina. So um, I, I, I think uh, in that sense, 9-11 uh, uh, is uh, singular uh, for no-fault treatment and probably should be treated as singular for no-fault treatment. We can't think within the lens just of no-fault uh, and tort either. First-party systems, whether it's public first-party systems or private loss insurance may be a much more efficient uh, and satisfying vehicle uh, for dealing with a particularly category two, categories two and three that I set out, that is man-made uh, and, uh, uh, and act of God uh, type disasters. So neither no for, fault nor tort can do all of the work for us. Now, having said that, just a couple of other uh, quick comments. Uh, was the individualization of awards uh, a good idea? This has been much, much uh, discussed. Uh, Ken has uh, thought and, and written about it uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, on many occasions, uh, so have other uh, commentators. Um, I don't think uh, that uh, the individualization uh, as it was embodied in the 9-11 scheme, so that the scheme became tort-centric, but it became tort-centric and at the same time confused because of the collateral source offset. Um, I, I don't think uh, that that was a sensible solution then, uh, and uh, if there were another no-fault uh, scheme for a horrid uh, terrorist event, I don't think it would be a good uh, approach to take in the future. But I don't think that one necessarily has to fall back, uh, as, as Ken does uh, generally when he talks about it, to uh, flat payments as the other option. That is not the only other option. It doesn't, a, a scheme doesn't have to be as tort-centric in its uh, re, uh, allowance for recovery of economic and non-economic loss as the 9-11 scheme was, or else resort to flat payments. There is a model, workers comp, uh, that falls squarely in the middle. Um, uh, it doesn't treat uh, everyone the same. It does take account of past income, uh, both in wrongful death cases and also in permanent partial disability cases. But on the other hand, it has ceilings uh, and caps um, and limitations so that it isn't as tort-centric as the 9-11 scheme was. So I'm very critical of the 9-11 scheme in that regard. I don't think, uh, particularly when we were addressing a community of victims, all of whom died 
uh, for the country that we had to recognize the disparities uh, that the 9-11 scheme did or else resort to flat payments. There was a middle approach uh, that, uh, that could have been taken. Finally, and this is the final thought, on the availability of the tort option, which uh, again is another uh, uh, major topic, uh, it was wise, I think, uh, to leave the tort option open, uh, as was done uh, in the 9-11 scheme. But in my view, the survivors uh, were badly misled uh, in thinking that it made sense uh, from an informational, a deterrence, or a process uh, perspective. And let me just say a couple words about each. From an informational perspective, that is, that tort would generate information about what happened that otherwise wouldn't be available. Tort, most of the cases got settled. Uh, and the one case that's remaining, what's it going to generate in information uh, that, uh, that, uh, that we don't know at this point uh, about uh, what happened? Uh, and it just, it seems to me that systematic studies of the kind that were done immediately after 9-11 uh, with uh, some expertise brought to bear from an informational standpoint are much more effective as a mechanism than the tort system. And one has to take into account that in those informational studies, if they had difficulty in getting some information from the government for security reasons, what about the tort system? Uh, in the in the in the tort cases, so uh, the informational argument uh, for um, uh, for allowing tort seems to me to be extraordinarily uh, weak. The deterrence argument also uh, is uh, extremely weak. Uh, the people who make it uh, have wear blinders uh, to the fact that within a few months there was a totally different airport security system. Uh, without uh, any benefits uh, of tort, uh, that if you go into any museum or stadium now, you're subject uh, to a check. We didn't need tort uh, for that. An event that was as traumatic uh, as 9-11 uh, was, uh, was bound to and did uh, generate um, massive changes in security, including on the part of the airlines, um, uh, in, in, airline, in, in airline design uh, that uh, were not reliant upon tort. Uh, now, having said that, I want to qualify it. Uh, I want to qualify it because, as I said earlier, not all mass disasters and certainly not all mass tort cases uh, are like 9-11. Uh, in the uh, drug cases like Zyprexa that um, Judge Weinstein referred to, um, it may very well be uh, that there is a powerful uh, deterrence argument uh, for having uh, tort liability, but that's a mass tort of a very different kind. Uh, finally, uh, the, uh, the uh, process uh, point. Um, <clears throat> uh, uh, Ken uh, provided uh, a great deal uh, of, uh, of process. He described it uh, uh, very well in his brief remarks, his book uh, on the 9-11 experience does a wonderful job of describing it. Uh, but there's a strong caveat when we think about the process perspective uh, as an argument for uh, a 9-11 type scheme in the future. Um, and that is, to begin with, uh, we wouldn't necessarily get Ken Feinberg. Uh, we probably wouldn't uh, as uh, the uh, special mediator uh, in the future. Um, and uh, combined with that is the point that Sheila made, uh, which is, uh, remember, 97% of the cases uh, were settled so that those that did go into tort uh, were able to do a lot of what Ken did in the system, uh, thanks to uh, Sheila and Mark Moeller and others um, uh, uh, in the settlement process of those 90-some uh, uh, cases. Um, expressive values uh, on the part of the victims uh, came into play. But suppose uh, instead of 90, there had been 2,500 or, or 8,000 um, in, uh, in the case of what Sheila's going to be facing now. 
uh, that's uh, that's a very different uh, that's a very different story, and it would put pressures on an administrative compensation scheme from a process standpoint uh, that uh, that are quite daunting. You, you got the list. Um, well, I, just want to res I just want to respond with two overarching points to Professor Rabin and Professor Mullenix. One, <clears throat> most of what they say, not all, but most is a political science opposition to the very genesis of these programs or concern. Concern. How they were drafted by policymakers, a judge in Agent Orange, the Congress in 9-11, a unique handshake between pre the, uh, the administration and BP. Most of the concern expressed is the very idea of these unique programs. And it's a political science point. My argument that I make is that if the policymakers want them, then they <coughs> exist. And Bob Rabin is really a congressman or a senator arguing on the floor of the U.S. Senate why it's not a good idea to single these out. Well. That is um, he's right. That and, and Professor Mullinus, that's armchair um, quarterbacking. You can make the argument, by the way, that what makes the 9/11 fund or BP different and unique is policy maker ratification. I mean, it's a rather democratic thing. You may vote against it, but if BP and the administration decide that $20 billion with a handshake, it is very unique. As Professor Rabin says, you think 9-11 is unique. A Fortune 500 company putting up $20 billion and admitting, you know, we've got to put it up and we'll be responsible for it. So, so a large part of the argument is preempted when I argue, I think, well, you, you can say why it's a bad public policy and not a good idea. It's done. It's different. It's done. Katrina didn't rise to that level. Maybe it should have, but it didn't. So that's point number one. Point number two is a point that I think everybody uh, ha hasn't really been discussed yet. It really hasn't. What is the alternative to some of these programs? Now, for years, Sheila and I would argue over whether or not the class action device as a model or as a basis for dealing with mass torts is sound public policy and within the rule of law. Rule 23. And Judge Weinstein, uh, I learned at his feet in terms of Rule 23. The fact of the matter is, I must say, in recent years, one, the, the courts are increasingly skeptical of Rule 23 as a device to resolve mass torts. The Supreme Court and, and circuit courts are increasingly questioning whether Rule 23 is a way to resolve mass torts. Well, if it's not a way to resolve mass torts, what is a better way? The very irony here is, just as I question whether or not BP or 9-11 is a precedent for very much, and I agree with Bob Rabin, it isn't and shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. But I must say a vacuum's being created here, because if, if Rule 23 is not going to be available, Walmart, the Second Circuit three weeks ago in Tassini, I mean, if, though, if Rule 23 is not available, now what do we fall back on? And maybe, ironically, it is these types of quasi-aggregative techniques that might be, by necessity, a flexible alternative. I don't know, but I do think that, that BP and 9-11, I must say, one can argue about the wisdom of those programs or not, but I look at them, they're set up. You ask somebody to do it, administer it, you do it. Now, in fairness to Professor Mullen, she questions some of the implementation, and that's fair enough, I and mean, we can talk about that. But the genesis of the programs is sort of vacuum um, insertion. In the absence of a better way, policymakers, not Ken Feinberg, say, let's do it.
So we've got lots of uh, people, I think, who want to jump in. We've got uh, some time left, but we have to keep our comments short. Sheila, do you want to go next? Uh, I'll try to be uh, short. Um, I think I think 9-11 is unique. Just looking this weekend of what the grief and the feelings are of the nation 10 years <coughs> later puts this in a very unique place. And we're never going to have this, hopefully, this kind of unique thing again. But we, there's much to learn about. And, you know, Ed, 10 years later, you can look at what Ken did, but he had to work on no background. He created this hybrid system that worked and satisfied the claimants. Now, this, this was a huge, brilliant endeavor when you really look at, you know, you could say that he didn't, he, he, he didn't follow a workers' comp system. Actually, he did. When you look at how the money was given out, some things, everyone got the same thing. They were all in the same situation. They should have gotten the same emotional distress. You could take into consideration in a fund like this different people's upsetness. There was a uniform upsetness that he gave compensation for. Yet if there was total disability or partial disability, people got different money, just like in a compensation system. So when you look at this, it was an incredible endeavor that was done, I think, in the most incredible way. Now, what we learn from that front and 9-11 is that we apply these techniques to settlements, to private settlements, all the time. Because there are all kinds of imaginative ways people are giving out money. Just take a look at the settlement of the 10,000 plaintiffs that had long-term, quote, disability as a result of 9-11. They were in the courthouse. That was just settled on a basis of looking at the injuries and looking and creating this very technical point system that gave people points. And that got translated into dollars. Now, some people might say that was pretty terrible, but it worked for the vast majority of the people involved. What lawyers bring to these settlements, and most of them are going to be private settlements and remain private settlements, is very creative ways of settling. But the real problem we have, without a class action settlement or bankruptcy or something that creates closure, you will not have the kinds of dollars that have been in the past to create the funds. We are creating private funds every day in this country to end litigation. But we have to end the litigation. Nobody is going to keep this up without some end. And that, I think, is the real challenge, both for the academics and the lawyers. If the class action settlement is not going to work, what are we going to put in to create an out? Linda. Linda, I think you want to jump in. Uh, yeah, again, so much to um, to respond to. Um, th there's a number of problems um, with um, trying to respond to this. First of all, it's really difficult to come back and argue against compassionate anecdote um, because you sound terrible, right? It sounds like you're a person lacking in compassion. But we have to find a way of talking about these things um, you know, that, that recognizes, um, you know, the humanity involved in the underlying disasters, but allows us to say, um, is what's going on here fair and just, and do we have some framework um, by which we, we can conceptualize what that requires, um, rather than appeals to our emotions. Um, and also, the, the people speaking to you are, um, they're vested in these programs, right? This is what they're doing, and so, um, I think justifiably they're going to come in and say this is what we do and, it, and it's really great. Um, just feeding off of what um, Sheila Birnbaum just said, um, this concept of private settlement, it really worries me tremendously, all right, because I think once we're talking about private settlement, we're talking about a bunch of guys getting in the back room and cutting a deal 
all right? And we're very, very far removed from the rule of law um, at that point, right? In the World Trade Center, um, at least we had some congressional oversight, we had congressional authorization, um, and, and there was some uh, reviewability, although even with the World Trade Center Fund, the decisions made by the special master in that um, ultimately were not subject to judicial review, and that's a part of the fund that you really don't know about. When we move over to the, B and, and by the way, also in response to Professor Rabin, he began by saying that, why are we talking about the Gulf Coast Claims Facility? We shouldn't be doing that. Well, that's precisely my point. I think that the title of this program is, um, you know, 9-11, um, the, the, the lessons of 9-11 for the yeah. future of mass tort. The BP Gulf Oil Coast Claims Facility is the future of mass toy. Exactly, the future is here, right? And it's playing off of the World Trade Center Victims Compensation Fund. And if there are legitimate points of concern about the victims, um, the World Trade Center Victims Compensation Fund, that's being played out, you know, 10 times exponentially over in, in the, um, the Gulf Coast Claims Facility. So I do think it's legitimately um, before us uh, today. And I can go down, I can do it because I didn't want to hog the time, but I can go down an entire list of problems um, that have been subject to comment and criticism um, about the implementation of the World Trade Center Fund. All of those, every single one of those points has been a problem in the Gulf Coast Claims Facility um, because um, uh, Administrator Feinberg used as his model for setting up the Gulf Coast Claims Facility what he did in the World Trade Center Fund. So they are directly, directly relevant. The big difference to me is with the Gulf Coast Claims Facility, unlike the World Trade Center Fund, you, you have a, um, a defendant. You have somebody, okay, who can be pointed to as responsible um, uh, for the, uh, the injuries that occurred there, unlike the World Trade Center Fund, which complicated um, the problem of pursuing litigation in the tort system uh, for people who were victims of the events at the World Trade Center. One last point I want to make, um, and this has always struck me, and it's something that Sheila Birnbaum in theory could answer, but she can't, um, and she won't. Um, it seemed to me that when the World Trade Center uh, Victims Compensation uh, Fund was set up, with the opportunity possibly to elect to go into the tort system, I thought this was very interesting because I, th I thought for the first time it set up a naturally occurring experiment that would give us the answer. Is it better for a claimant to go into a fund and take their remediation through the compensation that's going to be given to us by the fund as opposed to electing to go into the tort system, right? And the only way we can know the answer to that is if we could know what people who elected to stay in the tort system, what they received relative to what people who went into the fund. But because, and Sheila Birnbaum wrote a report after she was the mediator, mediating the claims um, that came through Judge Hellerstein's court. But she's not permitted to disclose to us um, what people took in the, um, the, the mediated settlements um, in comparison uh, to what people took um, through the fund. And it seems to me, again, if you're asking questions um, about fund approaches to resolving these types of claims as opposed to people electing voluntarily to go into the tort system, it would be useful, it really would be useful to have that type of answer. And there are differences. There are differences about the availability of being able to collect collateral source funds. Um, there are differences with regard to paying attorney's fees in the cases that went into the tort system. I would love to know the answers to those questions. I don't know that we're going to have them. One final point about voluntarily going into the tort system with the victim's compensation fund as opposed to what's going on down in the Gulf Coast. And that was very interesting because during the World Trade Center Fund, Ken Feinberg, in addition to going around and urging people to take their remedy through the fund, was also going around and telling everybody it's the only game in town, all right? Um, which is you really need to come into the fund because you don't want to go into the tort system because you're not going to be able to recover anything in the tort system. It's very, very bad for you. Fast forward to the BP Gulf oil spill. Um, and Ken Feinberg was flying all around the Gulf Coast towns and talking to basically all of the, the fishermen and the local businesses and everybody down there, and he essentially was telling them the same thing. 
you must come into the BP Gulf Oil Fund because it's the only game in town. And as Mr. Mueller knows very, very well, the plaintiff's lawyers down on the Gulf Coast went into federal court before Judge Barbier basically to seek an injunction um, to restrain Ken Feinberg from going around and urging claimants to go into the fund and not to elect to go into the tort system. And I will stop there. So we have a number, so I think in order would be John, Sheila, then Mark, okay? Great. Um, I'll be very brief because I know you have questions and maybe the audience yeah. has questions as well. I think um, just by way of back, backdrop, it would be um, helpful to think about the hybrid nature of the 9-11 fund um, because uh, you can imagine two reasons to have a fund at a very high level of abstraction. Uh, one is some people have been hurt, they're suffering uh, horrible setbacks through no fault of their own, and they have some claim against all of us that the burden ought to be shared. Um, that The prototypical case of that is <coughs> a natural disaster where we imagine there's no human element. Um, it's just misfortune in its purest sense, and we might well think under those circumstances, I expect we would think that there's a sharing that ought to go on, like a response to the tornado in Joplin or what have you, and that that's a reason for taxpayer money to go to people who've suffered a particular misfortune. That's one idea. There's another idea which says uh, people ought to get money where the money stands for something, and what it stands for is um, compensation for having been wrong. That is to say, it's compensation in the sense of somebody has done something to you that they ought not to have done to you and now owe it to you, right? And that's the classic tort scenario. That's in a, in a much simpler form is what something like a medical malpractice case is about or a slip and fall case is about, right? Um, the 9-11 fund is this fascinating what, part of why it's, we're all talking about it and still talking about it 10 years later and will be talking about it and why it should be taught in law school not only as a history lesson, but also as a lesson, if you will, in tort theory, um, on compensation theory, is uh, it's this weird mixture of both. So Bob rightly raises, well, gee, what about um, all the people who weren't included, at least initially, in the fund? And some, by the way, still aren't. What about all those people in New York City who were emotionally traumatized by 9-11 but did not suffer, did not inhale toxins and have no symptoms? They suffered a severe setback right? Nobody's thinking about compensating them from within the fund, and maybe that's the right answer. But there, um, the universe of claimants that were eligible to recover on the fund was very much defined on tort principles, not on setback principles, right? The people who are going to be able to recover, and again, I'm not saying this is right or wrong, it's just descriptive, are the people who we think of as classic injury victims, people who have been killed, people who've lost loved ones uh, who have been killed, people who've been physically injured. That's where the universe of claimants comes from who are eligible in the first place to claim from the fund. Second, um, uh, the, uh, as Mark mentioned, the, um, uh, the background here is a lot of these people have potentially viable tort claims, which is part of why you're getting a fund, because in the most crass way possible, as Ken said at the very beginning, the airline industry is now suddenly in danger here because it's possible, we don't know, um, it's possible that a number of these victims, many of these victims, thousands even, the many people on the ground, not just the airline passengers, would have viable negligence claims, for example, against the airlines, against the airline security companies, against the Boeing, uh, uh, against um, uh, uh, the uh, owners of the Port Authority, et cetera. So all of TORT is doing a huge amount of work there in getting the fund set up in the first place and in defining the universe of claimants. And then finally, as Ken noted, has that noted throughout, uh, TORT is also doing a huge amount of work in terms of setting the benchmark of compensation, this idea of full compensation. You get what you lost because of the TORT. You don't get a flat fee of $200,000 for the misery or the horribleness of being injured or losing a loved one, you get what you lost. You individually lost, and so you get huge variations from uh, the, uh, the people at the top of the buildings who are making millions of dollars and stand to make millions more uh, versus the custodians who stand to make relatively little, right? All of that is tort at work. Uh, and yet by the time we're done with the fund, and this is what makes it so fascinating, is uh, there's no inquiry at all into responsibility whether anybody did anything wrong, whether the government did anything wrong by failing to take better steps to protect against this sort of attack, whether any of the private defendants did anything wrong. No, we don't even talk about that for purposes of allocating money 
from the fund, right? Um, and uh, there's finally no holding accountable in the sense of the tort system. There's no, no, the outcome of the fund is not an identification of a responsible party who is made to pay because they are responsible parties, right? The government pays, we all pay, right? So what makes 9-11 fascinating is it's this simultaneous hybrid. And again, this may be, have been the right way to go. It's hard to know what success means in this context. What would have happened differently? Very hard to know. Did we spend enough money? Maybe, did we spend too much money? Right? Not a very pleasant question to ask and maybe an inappropriate question to ask, but a question worth asking, $7 billion, a lot of money. Right? All of that is tied up with this weird hybrid where we're simultaneously adhering to tort concepts and yet not. Sheila. Yeah, first, um, just let me say, Linda and I are always on the same side, except tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, Linda, you should, you should be saying we have a point of view. I don't have a point of view. I'm not a here to protect the fund or any fund. I'm, I'm a lawyer. Uh, I, I'm on full-time work as a lawyer. Uh, so I'm usually creating funds through mass settlements. Uh, at this particular point in time, <coughs> I'm a neutral, and it's a wonderfully exciting experience. Now, I think you asked the right question, and the right question is we had a little, a little laboratory we had a fund, and we had the court system. And you're right, we, we, everyone signed confidentiality statements, and to some extent it was to protect the victims and the claimants that people didn't know what each particular person got. And I'd be really happy to talk about what the differences are, because I know more or less what people in the fund got, and I know what everyone received in, in the, generally, I can, Absolutely, people are differently situated. The two systems were different. You had to approach it differently because wrongful death statutes vary from state to state. Whose law applied became important in analyzing the cases. I mean, Mark knows this. When we sat down and you discuss a case, you are now discussing a case under the tort system. And people that opted out opted out for many reasons. Some of them did worse in the settlement than they would have done if they would have stayed in the fund. Many did better because they were high income earners, very high, with lots of life insurance. And that's why they particularly didn't go into the fund because the fund wasn't useful for them because so much would have been deducted from what they were to get. So the answer to that is, and someday when we're down the road a little, I'm sure all the amounts can come out without names, but without knowing what each situation was, there's nothing to compare to. It's not a natural experiment at all. It, it's just yeah. different. There are different systems with different results. Mark. I, I, <coughs> I claim a unique perspective. We represented 350 families in the victim, before the Victims' Compensation Fund. We represented people in the lawsuit uh, against the airlines. We represent claimants in the BP Fund. And it all comes down, at the end of the day, to money. A client comes into you, whether he's a commercial client in the BP case or a victim in 9-11, whether he's a claimant who's going to come into the, to the reopened VCF or the original VCF, and they say, what should I do? The object is to give them the best shot at the best recovery under the circumstances that they face at a particular time. When people came to us when the Victims' Compensation Fund was created, the Victims' Compensation Fund was as new to Ken Feinberg as it was to us. Nobody had ever seen this before. The Victims' Compensation was an expression of national grief described in terms of dollars will give you money. And the reason the Victims' Compensation Fund was crafted in that context was because they couldn't protect the airlines, completely insulate the airline coffers from exposure to claims because the liability of the airlines was limited to their insurance. The airlines were scot-free. 
Nothing could ever touch them, the way the statute was drawn. Now, what are you going to do with the people who are buried in the rubble of the World Trade Center? you got to do something. So why was it... This, uh, why was the statute created in two days? Because they couldn't present the Airline Stabilization Act without doing something for the victims. It's just politically impossible. So they rush, rush, they put together a victim's compensation fund, economic loss, non-economic loss, plus circumstances of the claimant minus collateral sources. Circumstances of the victim of the claimant was the discretion. Was the, was the avenue through the expression. Of the, so what, it, what's, what was Ken going to do? I mean, we really had it out during some of these, what are the regulations going to say? What are they going to mean? You've, if you've got all this discretion, lean our way. But obviously, couldn't do that in its entirety. For example, life insurance. I presented a lengthy memorandum to Ken, and I said, life, there are two kinds of life insurance. There's the kind that's purchased for you, and there's the kind that you purchase for yourself. If I take some of my hard-earned dollars and decide to invest for my family in whole life insurance, why take that away from me? That's not a death benefit. That's an investment. On the other hand, if the employer gives you life insurance as a fringe benefit, that is a death benefit associated with employment. I couldn't sell it. But, the, but, but uh, that's right. But, but the real world was that nobody knew what the heck to do. And nine, the reason you had this cry out in 9-11 and probably will not have a 9-11 kind of fund again with the next terrorist attack is because this terrorist attack was the first. This is what shook us out of a reverie. We thought that the oceans would protect us. Nobody would cross the Pacific. Nobody would cross the Atlantic and attack us. They were right. They took the planes out of Boston. That's what happened. So the country is in a state of shock. So in the state of shock, you may not be thinking as rationally as you are 10 years down the road, but that's what happened. But the model of some kind of fund to deal with mass torts, mass disasters, is a practical necessity. They can't mirror that. I would, I would storm the House of Congress if they tried to do it again. But some kind of mass mechanism to solve mass torts were a lot of, you just can't you can't deal with it in in any uh, in, in any other way but, but but that's the real world the comp it's called the victim compensation fund it's not a love in it's about money and so, how do you protect your client that's what the question is so I'm gonna I'm gonna take the uh, the moderator's prerogative asking a question I've been wanting to ask for a long time not just today um, it goes back to Ken's point of uh, we need to ask about in evaluating the Victims' Compensation Fund and thinking about if, it, if any aspect of it can be reproduced, um, compared to what. And, um, and we, I think, are blinded by the fact that it seemed to be so successful as if that's the measure of success. I mean, it makes people happy, therefore it's successful. But I think there are other measures of success, which is whether or not um, it was necessary. I mean, to me, it, 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 the question of whether the VCF um, was successful is whether or not it was the only al alternative available to us given what we knew then, but also given what we know now. And back then, I think it was. I don't blame anyone for picking it. But I just want to sort of pro provoke the, the, the panel, because some of you actually have a lot more information than I do, which is um, back then, uh, there were three reasons for the VCF. Uh, one was that liability uh, if pursued through normal channels of negligence law against the defendants would be devastating, especially to the airline industry. Uh, the second was that uh, um, the experience of litigation, uh, if pursued against the defendants in negligence law, given the process of trials and the O.J. Simpson case and, tort, and the people's vision of tort law in America and how it's done by, by lawyers in front of juries, would be emotionally devastating. The country couldn't handle it, right? So we couldn't let that happen. And finally, and then there was the last, which I think was genuine, but I think relatively ad hoc, which was that uh, the victims were, um, were like soldiers or like national sacrificers. They were heroes, and therefore we should help them because they had done something in the name of the country. Um, I really want to focus on the first two. I mean, the is the first two really true? I mean, is it really true that we couldn't have tried these cases? Um, let me finish the question. Okay. Uh, for example, 
um, and this goes back to something Roger said. Uh, you know, the joint civil liability is a relatively recent change in our treatment of defendants. Uh, I actually think that um, John and I can argue about this, that you know, I'm not quite sure Blackstone really thought it was right. I'm not quite sure how architectonic it is. And um, rather than, uh, than bully people out of the tort system into the VCF, which is what we did, basically, um, why not just tweak the, t the tort system, change the, through federal uh, uh, law uh, the operation of the tort system in all 50 states just by suspending joint and civil liability and insisting on proportionate liability? Could the airlines have survived jury verdicts? that so we had an experience in the 93 WTC case where the defendant was actually found to be more than 50% liable. But here, just imagine what would have happened. He went in front of juries and said, so you have to apportion it now. There's an absent defendant. We do this all the time in first-year torts. There's an absent defendant, the drunk driver, and then there's the doctor who's the med mal defendant. Who's what? the absent defendant in your hypothetical? The terrorists. And the government. The terrorists. Have the jury apportioned. I'm talking about because I can think about it differently. Have the jury apportioned between the defendant, absent defendant, the terrorists, and, the, and Boeing, the door manufacturer. Could we have survived financially that way? Would that have worked? And if so, wouldn't that have been the tort system at work as much as we could have preserved? And secondly, and you know this, Mr. Mueller, better than anyone, given the amount of supervision by Hellerstein on the amount of evidence that's actually permitted into the one case that's going forward and the cases that's settled, um, what would have happened if, in fact, discovery had gone forward? Would it have been traumatizing for the nation, given how Hellerstein has permitted certain evidence to go forward, have re has insisted on in-camera inspection of evidence? I mean, wasn't there a way of tweaking the trial process so that it wouldn't have been um, impossible to try these cases? That's just a question for all of us. Because if it were, then why did we need the VCF? Let me go third, because Ken's got something to say. I don't it's, want Rabin, to... it's Ra Professor Rabin Redux is your question again. I don't know the answer to those questions. I, I, I await with great interest what other panelists say. I can only answer this way. Congress said yes to those questions. Your elected, democratically elected officials decided that the airlines couldn't survive, that it was unlikely that the airlines could survive without a VCF that the Congress wanted to demonstrate, as Mark Muller pointed out, its collegiality, support, and sense of community with the victims, vengeful philanthropy to show the world, you will not divide us. And so they passed a law. Now, if we're going to spend a few minutes now, I, I, I wait with great interest. What would have happened if? The if I don't really focus on, because I had a statute that was enacted and signed by the president. And I don't think it'll be enacted again, and I don't think it'll be signed again that way. I mean, there's a big difference between a statute that says the taxpayer will put up whatever it takes, and Linda saying, you know, well, this is the same thing, basically. It's $20 billion put up by a private entity, which, as Professor Rabin points out, is unique in itself in American history. So I'm glad to these theoretical questions, by all means, Mark and Sheila and Bob Rabin and Ra everybody, chime in, but I didn't deal with it. Congress did it and answered your questions, I think. Well, there's a follow-up from, uh, from what Ken just said. I mean, are you assuming a total silence so far as the tort cases would have proceeded on the part of Congress or the states? In other words, no limitations at all? Well, the joint and several lives, that's no, the no, But, but uh, Ken, Ken is right. Ken did, can administer the statute, but that's not that's not really not the answer to the question. That's right. Could the could the airline industry have survived? I believe the answer is yes, for two reasons. Now I'm under I'm under certain gag orders, and I can't talk about everything under the sun. So I'm, if I sound rather circumspect, but use the mic anyway, even if you're under a gag order. <laughs> <laughs> it's intentional. If you have if you have Boeing liability, there's coverage. Coverage. You know, Boeing doesn't really have to worry unless it's got a problem. The airlines have coverage. We knew, and it was publicly stated, that the aggregate insurance that was available, in all likelihood, was something like six to eight billion dollars. But the claims were in the teens. So if we won and got the coverage that we wanted, the airlines themselves could go into bankruptcy with some all kinds of protections. Many airlines have gone into bankruptcy to get rid of a union contract or one liability or another. But the insurance remains available. So if you have 50 cents on the dollar and you win 50 cents on the dollar in coverage, you can be a hero, but you're only going to get 50, 50 cents on the dollar. 
So when you look at what <coughs> you could get under the fund structure, you ask the question, as I measure the risks, because okay, to this day I don't know what would have happened to some of my clients had they litigated to judgment, because it hasn't happened. But as you do that analytical work, I figured that for some of the clients, the best thing to do, balancing the risks at the time you make the assessment, take the money. And then there's a, there was another reason. Judge Hellerstein, it, to his credit, exercised very strict control over this case. And he, he believes, as I, as I watched him in the courtroom, I don't have any inside track on this, as I watch him in the courtroom, he knew that there were litigation issues and litigation risks, and his interest was protecting the people and helping them make a judgment. So we had to sit with uh, Sheila and the judge from time to time to discuss various cases. Okay. So, who, Ken, is, Ken is writing it. Who knows what's, what was going to happen? But if this conversation is about should the 9-11 fund be repeated, the answer is no. Categorically no. Are fund mechanisms part of the future? The answer is yes. What does it do to the litigation process? I think the litigation process is essential to make these funds work because the client's got to know what his alternative is to this kind of a system. Now, if you look at the political landscape today, you will not have the government giving out free money. We, we are in a Donnybrook about whether or not people should get money because their houses were blown away. You don't know what's going to happen. So the only thing you know about is what happened yesterday. was the easiest case you ever worked on. Um, I said that. You did, you did. And let, let me just read you the whole quote. You said, um, qualitatively, these are all traumatic deaths and injuries. There isn't a question of did the chemical cause the cancer, or did the medical device cause the injury. The causation here is pretty much a given, right? So, so, just, so that's the full context. Um, context is important. Yes, context is important. So I think just this picks up on, I think, trying to pull together some of the different strands. Strikes me that this goes to the question of whether, of just how sui generis this case was, uh, uh, the 9-11 compensation fund, whether this sort of no-fault administrative compensation scheme works better in some sorts of situations than others. Uh, Bob Raven's given us a sort of trifecta to think about the different types of scenarios in which uh, administrative no-fault could be used, but some seem better than others, right? And when we talk about BP or the GCCF, I think one of the concerns is causation or where we draw the lines. <coughs> and whether we feel comfortable having one person draw the lines um, as opposed to having multiple juries in either a bellwether context or in a, a it just sort of generally uh, have different juries decide. So I just wonder what the panel thinks about, uh, we know this is sui generis. I think everybody on the panel has used those words at this point, right? But we, we also know that we're <coughs> going to draw lessons from the 9-11 fund, right? It's not replicable, but aspects of the fund will be replicated. Right? We will use it, and it will, have an at, it will have an effect on the litigation system, whether, it's an altern whether the litigation system exists as an alternative. However it works, there's going to be some bleed over effects. So I guess I just wonder, are there scenarios, and we can leave terrorism aside because I think none of us wants to think about another 9-11, but are there scenarios in which you think an administrative no-fault system fund works better than others? So if we take environmental versus um, mass medical harm versus um, uh, man, uh, uh, natural disasters um, that, are, that are different from BP, I think, sort of hurricanes or, uh, or earthquakes, are there certain types of situations where you all on the panel as experts would feel more comfortable with us turning as a nation towards no-fault administrative systems and other scenarios where you would hope that we would give tort a go? Um, and I just wondered if we could talk about, about that. I guess we're, we're in a system that, that is both a tort and no fault system. Because what happens is, if you're in a big mass tort, how many cases do you think ever get tried? I mean, realistically, there's no such thing as trials. There are some trials. There may be three, four, 10, 20. 
I mean, that's huge in any mass tort to have 20 trials. What that does is inform the parties so that they can then sit down and negotiate a settlement and create a fund. That's what happens. We're creating funds every day. Most of the funds have some oversight from a court because they're, they're done as class actions or even as mass torts, the court is overseeing an MDL and is looking at it and it's not done in a dark room because it may start out in a dark room, but eventually it has to have transparency where there are gonna be objectors and people are going to try to knock holes in the fund. So even here, if you would have gone if we would have gone the tort system, no fund, what would have happened is the same thing. You would have had a settlement that would have been done, and it would have been similar to what just happened in the fund. And I assure you that there would have been no cases dropped. There would have been a settlement. Because there are risks. There were very heavy risks here of finding no liability. And what happened was, People didn't want to take those risks. They first went into the fund or they settled when, the, when it occurred. So I think we are in a mixed system now. I would want to just amend my remarks. I don't mean to suggest that we'd have to go to trial for all the Yeah, no, I understand. Right, but, but the litigation system writ large as opposed to the fund is different. Are we Linda, then John? Yeah, and then I think the questions. Okay. Yeah. I just think that we're fundamentally asking the wrong question. I think the question is not, are we in an era of private settlements and do private settlements go on all the time? I think the question we have to ask is, if that is the reality, is what we're doing, is it fair and just? And, and my further question is, is pragmatism a theory of justice? Because that's what I'm hearing. And, and I really, really worry about that. I know that if I'm involved in some mass calamity or mass disaster, I don't want a bunch of guys getting together in some private room, um, possibly with the bad actor, and these people getting together and decide, okay, what's gonna happen to me by way of remediation. Um, I also just wanna say, kind of as a closing remark, I'm very happy to hear everybody on this panel seem to say and agree that the World, Center, uh, World Trade Center Victims Compensation Fund was unique and sui generis and on its own and not to be repeated. And my question is, well, if you all agree on that, then why are we repeating it? Why are we repeating in almost every single aspect of implementation of the ongoing fund that is now out there? Um, uh, almost all of the same problematic things that went on with the World Trade Center Fund that have been subject to really close academic scrutiny and criticism. We're doing it again, and we're doing it again in a context that's really unlike um, the, the events that gave, wide, right, that gave rise to the World Trade Center Fund, and that's what I find so troubling. Uh, two very small points, uh, I think. One is, um, to your question, Miriam, um, uh, the, um, the choice between uh, an administration comp ministry of compensation scheme and a no-fault, as you say, where the government posts a, a, a pile of money or puts a pile of money aside and says people who meet certain criteria can uh, claim under this fund versus uh, litigation in, in a tort model is not a, is not a contrast between um, uh, trials, as you say, and no trials. It's about the basis for on which money is being paid out, right? And uh, keep in mind that the only reason we have settlements and the only reason we have an administrative compensation scheme in this particular case is because we're presupposing the possibility of tort liability. So really what we'd want to ask is, would we want a system where there was no tort at all and an administrative scheme? versus do we want a system where there's tort and no administrative scheme or some combination, which is what we have now. The problem with administrative compensation schemes potentially by themselves without a tort backdrop is their government largesse. You are dependent on government to come up and say, you know what, this is one of those incidents where we're gonna share the burden. You know, folks in Joplin, good news, we're gonna share the, we're gonna share the burden with you. That's a governmental political decision the genius and simultaneously the defect of the tort system, what makes it so fascinating, is it empowers individuals 
It gives individuals the right to claim. The government doesn't have to sign off on the claim. The government doesn't have to set aside money in the traditional tort case. It's someone coming to court and saying, this was done to me such that I am entitled to compensation, roughly. So um, what we're deciding is, in part, as Ken has suggested, and Bob is uh, the master of this, it, what part of what we're deciding is an institutional question and a political question about where do we want the power to make the decision about compensation to reside? Do we want it to reside in political bodies that are accountable, democratic, etc., or do we want it to reside in individuals? Uh, those are very hard questions and I think do depend on not only the type of incident that the law is responding to, but also what we want to accomplish in responding to that incident. Uh, Just a very quick uh, follow-up on, on John. Um, the, uh, John, the assumption that uh, no-fault schemes uh, in the future would mirror uh, the victim compensation fund in the sense of being government funded is a big assumption. In fact, none of the other major no-fault schemes are government funded, whether it's workers' comp or vaccine no-fault or, um, or auto no-fault. None of them are government funded. So that, that, that's a, a very major assumption. Now, uh, related to that, but, but they are government enacted. And that's what's troubling, and it raises another question, because the issue is, are we talking about an ad hoc scheme that's adopted spur of the moment, like 9-11, or are we talking about a 9-11, uh, an ongoing scheme? Uh, and if we're talking about reacting to individual super traumatic events through no-fault schemes, that's extremely unsettling to me from a political standpoint because Congress is totally unpredictable and willful, and indeed the states are as well. Um, look at asbestos. We never got an asbestos no-fault scheme, even when the tort system was almost on its knees. Um, on the other hand, when industries um, use their muscle, uh, as in the case of Price Anderson, or black lung, then we do get a no-fault scheme. So it's it's ad hoc in a way that's really troubling to a kind of fundamental notions of democracy and legitimacy. Um, and, and that's something we hadn't talked about either. I have 30 seconds to say that the government is involved in every single settlement as a major, major player. Because as soon as you make a tax deduction for the amount you put into the fund, the government is paying the corporate tax rate as as a contributor. And if you think that isn't a major factor in how much money goes into the fund, you're, uh, you, you know, you're swimming in Disneyland. Good point. Yeah. So should we ask the questions? I think we have, how much time can we have? Okay, so we have, um, we have microphones. So if you want to ask a question, just come up to the microphone, be orderly, be not New Yorkers, just stand in line. <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm George Kunk. Uh, <clears throat> I guess two comments. First on the 9-11 fund. I think if we take a realistic political view of it, it was completely unnecessary. Uh, the, the airlines went to Congress in a moment of hysteria and said, we're ruined, and they knew why they were ruined. Uh, they'd fought, or why they were, because they, first they were overreacting, and second, they knew what the basis of liability was. They knew that they'd fought against hardened cockpits, and uh, they knew that everybody had, had that uh, the planes had been broken into. And uh, there was a, a pretty plain product liability case there against Boeing, too. So that was a protect these large industries uh, move. Uh, as to what would have happened, what should have happened in, in tort litigation there, pretty much what happened in the 1993 uh, tort litigation, they were enabling torts. Uh, the only thing that really went wrong there is that the judge made the mistake of asking the jury to compare the wrong of the wrongfulness of the terrorists to the, the Port Authority, and that was irrelevant. The only real question was, in light of the foreseeable risk, was the Port Authority negligent? Answer, yes. And what should be the compensation? And we could have approached the uh, uh, the World Trade Center bombings, the 9-11 the bombings, in the same way without confronting any great 
doctrinal challenges in tort law, and we would have ended up, just like Sheila said, with uh, a handful of, of, of cases. And honestly, the, last, the only really, really major huge litigation I've ever been in was uh, the Vioxx cases where I worked uh, post-trial on appeals. Honestly, it's kind of simpler litigation than the Vioxx cases. The Vioxx cases were actually more complicated. So I think the answer is the fund was politically desirable, but doctrinally unnecessary, and therefore it need not be repeated. Now, what do we do about the Gulf uh, Claims Fund? The Gulf Claims Fund is a different proposition. The thing that drew the most criticism about the 9-11 fund was Ken Feinberg's discretion. And everybody agreed that it was huge and essentially uncontrolled by anybody else and there were no appeals. And I think we all agree, and I've, I've written as much, that he was Solomonic and we uh, all admire what he did and think it was handled very well. So what happens with the Gulf Claims Fund? The problem with the Gulf Claims Fund is that Feinberg is asked to do something that the tort system does peculiarly poorly. And that is the Oil Pollution Act of 1990 says that the designated responsible party has to enact a has to adopt a procedure for payment of interim claims. The tort system does better when a series of claims has matured, when we have, say, in Vioxx, lots of epidemiological evidence about what the risk of the disease is and, and the like. Uh, but handling interim claims to put money in people's pockets now, it does very badly. But there is uh, substantial experience there uh, in our system, and that is the workers' compensation system. And so I think the, the problem is, is that Feinberg has been asked to ad administer a statute for BP that requires them to adopt an interim claims uh, program, but it's completely unregulated. There are no government regulations. There are no standards. There is no administrative procedure. So I think that the, the lesson I drew off from that for, uh, for the Gulf Coast claims is we need a set of regulations that establishes a workers' compensation type system for interim claims in mass disasters like oil pollution. Um, further questions? Is that a question? Yes. Yeah. Hi. Uh, first, uh, thank you, first and foremost, for everyone for coming. Uh, this was a fantastic way to take three, four weeks of law school, first three or four weeks of law school, and make it alive. Um, not to the class. Is, is your professor here? <laughs> <laughs> more alive. Even more alive. Um, but I, uh, I really appreciated uh, Judge Weinstein's uh, sort of emphasis on creating a connection to the claimants. Uh, in one part, having done work similar to that in New Orleans and seeing when Mr. Feinberg came down, the dignity, the way of giving what now in this new language perhaps a fair hearing to or a fair sense of hearing to people's trauma or misfortune. Um, but you opened up, and this was something that was hit on throughout the discussion, was this understanding of success. And you know, as, a, as any business person or nonprofit programs manager, so what is success? How do we define it? So is the question better, are we providing justice? And do you feel that the 9-11 fund has provided justice for its claimants, and then the Gulf Coast Fund, and if so, why, and if not, why not? And that's whoever is. Well, let me just pick up what Roger said, because, I mean, I um, don't have really the luxury of theorizing about what constitutes justice in the administration of these programs where I'm trying to get money out the door. I've always thought myself that in a voluntary program, if in fact there is um, uh, fair notice and an understanding of your options, which is a big question, which Linda and others have raised, whether or not people really do understand their choice. And Judge Weinstein talking about why he didn't think in Suprexa he succeeded in getting people to understand the basis of the deal. 
I've always looked at the people who exercise that choice. I don't know what else to, to say is, is the definition of justice. In the, uh, I point with pride to 97% of the, of the families of the dead in 9-11 coming into the fund. And I point with pride to Sheila getting all but one of the people in the private litigation to come into the fund, I mean, uh, to settle. So I think that that is a fair test. I've said in the, in the Gulf Coast Claims Facility, BP, at the end of the day, are we going to be able to get more than 90% of the people in the Gulf to accept the voluntary choice? Uh, I can be criticized, I guess, for is it really voluntary? Do people really understand their options? To their And Sheila's right. When you have got, I mean, I must say, um, with BP, unlike 9-11, I've, I've received so far in one year over a million claims from 50 states and 37 foreign countries. So it's not so easy to talk about access and hearings and the ability to be heard and venting. And I've received in the 9-11 in the fund, I received 7,300 claims. I've received that in less than a week in the BP oil spill. And it's a real problem. It's a real problem how volume, but Sheila mentioned this, it's a real problem how volume, the sheer magnitude, the quantitative aspect of the claims impacts your ability to be as hands-on and as one-on-one -on -one as you would as you would hope to be. I think the answer to the question is there's no one-size-fits-all justice. So I think we have time for one more question, and then we'll have time for a reception, I think, afterwards. Sir, would you like to ask? Uh, terrific program. Uh, full, my name is Gary Schaefer. I worked on the defense of uh, these ca these cases for several years, and I have strong opinions about a lot of it. I do think the original Victim Compensation Fund worked very well. Uh, I think there are questions about the second one that Professor Mullenix raises in terms of uh, full disclosure and fairness. Uh, one of the things that I think, uh, one of the alternatives, the question arose as to alternatives. I think one alternative that would address some, certainly not all, of the issues that were raised today would be universal health care. Obviously, you know, something like the Zadroga bill <laughs> is only necessary because people aren't entitled to the same kind of health care, and that health care shouldn't be determined by whether, in fact, uh, I'm a first responder, whether I'm somebody who came upon the scene, or whether I just was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And that would resolve a lot of the issues, both of fairness and equal treatment. Uh, with regard to the second, and this relates a little bit to the second iteration of the fund, uh, and in terms of what might be the lack of disclosure. I mean, these are public monies that are being spent, and as I believe Professor Mullenix also said, uh, there are a lot of vested interests that develop around these things. It can be from the, the legal system, the medical system, uh, the political system, and some of them are, uh, let's say, maybe more valid than others. Uh, and there are lots of pressures that come to bear. Um, but whether monies, in fact, are being spent properly or not, and then what we should do in the future may be contingent on determining whether monies are being spent now. So while you can set up a point system, for example, to determine what people uh, might be owed, which has a certain aura of fairness to it, I wonder as well, is there, in fact, the type of investigation into individual claims that will show that people, in fact, are entitled to anything or more or less? Uh, you know, obviously the, the mortality rate from those people affected by uh, the World Trade Center tax is 100 percent. 100 years from now, everybody will be dead, and every, as will most of the people in this room, and we'll all die from various things and various illnesses, and you know, there'll be cancers and there'll be other diseases. Um, okay. And the question is, where where does the money, where does the government put its money or not put its money? Uh, as was discussed earlier. So universal health care takes care of some of that. It doesn't take care of wrongful deaths necessarily. It doesn't take care of property damage, obviously. But I think the other thing that really is important is disclosure of monies that are paid out and the basis for those payments. Uh, any comments on the question? Or we, I would love to be able to begin to thank you, although I'll never be able to finish thanking you uh, for coming. And thank you to the audience and the questions. And. Uh, there will be a reception following this, and also um, uh, Ken Feinberg has brought uh, his book, uh, which he's actually offering, I believe, are you going to just sign copies and give them to people? Is this, yeah? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I'm wondering, uh, half of that statement's true. <laughs> okay, okay, good. Well, I wasn't sure. So we have, a, we have your book. You'll really sign them in the lobby, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and uh, Ken will be out in the lobby as well. And I hope all you'll join us for the reception now. Thank you very much. Yeah.